So I need to pay Bob a lot of money for that introduction, you know. Yeah, I need to pay him. <coughs> um, thank you for letting me come, and I, I thank you for the uh, opportunity to be with you and share, hopefully, a message that just goes with other things that you've been hearing already uh, and uh, that, that it'll make a difference to you and just add to that in some way. Yeah, I thought this was a cute picture. Uh, beautiful feet. Uh, we're talking about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want to take you back to uh, a story in the Old Testament. Hollis sort of gave you this picture last night that probably you all, all know and you all remember, but, but let's just remember an Old Testament picture for just a minute, a story. David has been betrayed by his son Absalom. And Absalom has fought against David's armies, and he has lost. Absalom dies in the tree, as you'll remember. Um, but how do you get news back from the battlefield to, to David, who was not allowed to go into the battlefield? You send runners, don't you? And there were, there were really two men that ran. One of them didn't know that Absalom was dead. The other one did. But that's not really part of what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about those runners. This one man wanted to run, and Joab said, No, let's send the Cushite. Let's let him run with the news. But then the one who wanted to run also said, Let me run too. And so Joab let him run. He outran the other man, and got to David and gave the report. But he didn't have the full report. And then here comes the second man with the full report. And we won't talk about what he said about Absalom's death, but here are the words that he said first of all. My Lord the King, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all those who rose up against you. 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 31. So, <clears throat> as all the people in Jerusalem and, and Judah were waiting for news, have we won? Have we won? Are we going to go into slavery? Are we, going to be, are we going to be stolen from? Are there going to be a lot of bad consequences of the battle? They're waiting for the runner to bring good news. And so in an Old Testament story context, it was about bringing good news of salvation from an enemy. That's what it was about. That's, what the, that's what the, how beautiful are the feet of the runner coming from the battlefield to say, we won! We won! That's what the good news picture in the Old Testament is. But when Paul borrows a text from the Old Testament... He borrows, not from that story, but he borrows from Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. When he, in Romans chapter 10, and we'll look at that in just a minute, when he borrows a text to, to talk about going into all the world and preaching the gospel, he borrows Isaiah 52 verse 7. Let's read that. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who proclaims peace, who brings good, glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now tell me, what's in Isaiah 53? Somebody tell me, what's in Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53, the picture of the great Messiah to come, Jesus. Jesus, Isaiah 53, and actually part of the end of Isaiah 52 is about the coming of the suffering servant named Jesus who will bring good tidings of great joy. But before Isaiah gets to that picture, he's talking about the Jews being delivered from bondage, slavery, and captivity. You see, they've already been in Egyptian bondage, haven't they? Many centuries before. 
with Pharaoh. And then part of the northern tribes got sent off into Assyrian captivity. I mean, they have had some history of being involved in bondage and slavery. And Isaiah is going to tell them, you're going off again. Babylon is going to come get you. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come get you and take you off into captivity. And Jeremiah will say it's for 70 years. Away from temple, away from their homes, away from their crops, away from their freedom. They can't worship. But Isaiah also says there will come a time when you, the nation of Israel, in, in bondage, in exile, in Babylon, will receive good news. You get to come home. You get to go home. You get to rebuild the temple. You get to worship God again. Good news. But then also Isaiah is saying, but the ultimate the big one who's bringing the real good news of spiritual salvation is Jesus Christ. He's bringing the good news. So, in Romans chapter 10, when Paul, the writer, decides that he's going to talk about this sharing of the word, and this has been mentioned a number of times in the workshop already, he says, how can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear lest someone preach to them? And how can they preach unless someone sins? As it is written, and this is where he borrows Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We won. That's what the good news message is. We went to Calvary. We saw the battle fought. We have been to the empty tomb. And we know we won. That's what the beautiful feet are about the good news. But you know, it's interesting that yesterday in this room, Tom and Phil talked from Romans chapter 8 about all kinds of trials that are part of our lives. All kinds of difficulties. You talked about that a lot. There's, there are a lot of other passages in the New Testament that talk about those trials. And so, those trials are there. How, do, how, do, how, how can we say, we won, we won, when all those trials are in place? How can we say to people out there who are experiencing all those different kinds of trials, all kinds of trials, we won, we won. What will be the reaction to that? We want to talk about the beautiful feet of Jesus. You've already talked about the beautiful feet of Jeremiah, and Paul, and Peter. And now let's talk about the beautiful feet of Jesus. And I, I, I'm going to try not to repeat what hopefully you've already heard. Here's the way I want to approach this beautiful feet of Jesus. I, I want to take you to several stories where Jesus came to somebody to talk to them. And I, I'm going to try to use that as a particular category of people that he's telling us we need to go to as well. And some of these maybe are a little out of the ordinary. You, you just got through talking with, with Mike about accepting different kinds of people within the body of Christ. Now, I want to go outside the body of Christ. I want us to talk about those different kinds of people, those different kinds of categories of people out there that we're going to have to evangelize. Of course, once they come into the body, yes, there has to be acceptance, Romans 14 and Romans 15. But even before they get in the, in the body, there's going to have to be a willingness to go to all different kinds of people. Having said that, I don't pretend to know your culture nearly as well as my own. I don't, tend to, I don't know the northern United States culture as well as I know Texan culture. I don't know African culture as well as I know New Zealand culture. So I'm going to just 
suggest some areas to you that I see about Jesus and the feet that he used to take the good news to some particular kinds of people. And then you take that and you run with that in your community and in your culture and in your town with your congregation. So here's the first one. These stories I know you know well. The first one's the paralytic. The paralytic. In Luke chapter 5, verses 13 through 32. This is in a, in a particular spot in Luke. You see, in chapter 4, he has been healing people. A lot of people. He even healed a mother-in-law. So we don't want to get into that, do we? Uh, he's, he's healed people that are outcasts in that society. Uh, he has exercised a demon out of a person. He's cast an evil spirit out of a person. Well, while he's doing that, right in the middle of some of those healings, at the end of chapter 4, I want to I tell you what he says. One day early, Luke says, it's early in the morning. He goes out on his own to pray. Now, Jesus is very popular at this point. I mean, he is healing a lot of people. He's helping a lot of people. And the people where he is probably think, well, he's going to stay right here. He's going to clean out our hospitals. Everybody's going to have health. That's why he came. He's our boy. He's a Galilean. He's from Nazareth. He's our guy. Jesus goes out to a place all by himself and prays. And out of that prayer comes the following statement when his apostles find him and say what are you doing out here there are people in the city that are waiting for you to come and heal them and jesus gives this answer as a result of his prayer he says i must preach the good news of the kingdom sorry about that i must preach the good news of the kingdom of god to the other towns also because that is why I have come. So Jesus had to get to the point where he realized, I'm not just about helping people through their physical maladies, and their calamities, and their sicknesses. There is more to why my good feet, beautiful feet, are moving through Palestine. Why are they moving through Palestine? Just to lay hands on and heal somebody? Just to cast out an evil spirit? just to help my mother-in-law get better? Jesus says, no, no. I've got to go to other towns because they don't just need healing. They need the proclamation of the good news. That's why I've come. Not just to clean out the hospitals. So, right after that, in chapter 5, he calls the, he calls the first apostles. He says, let's go fishing for men. Don't fish for fish anymore. Let's go fishing for men. And then he takes them to the site where the paralytic is going to get healed. So what happens on that occasion? Just another healing? See, remember, this is a different town now. He's gone on to another town after he said, I must go preach the good news. He went to another town, but his reputation is, is that he's a healer. So, as you recall the story, the men can't get the man into the presence of Jesus so he can heal him. What will they do? What will they do? Tear off the tiles on the roof. Let him down. And they watch. Yeah, Jesus is going to heal him, right? Jesus says what? What does he say? You remember? Sins are Your sins are forgiven. What? What? Your sins are forgiven. I thought he was going to say, get up and you're healed. Uh, he's going to say that, isn't he? But he wants to make a statement here. He wants to say, my feet are about the good news, not just helping people over their hurts, not just helping people over their hurts. So, Here's what I want to say. After, right after that incident, along comes a man named Levi. 
He's a tax collector, you remember. And, and Jesus is going to invite him into his band. And some, some Jews are upset about that. And Jesus makes this statement. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, the Jews that were upset with Jesus for calling people like Levi were upset because they thought, well, we don't, we don't think those sinners, as if they're not sinners themselves, we don't think those sinners should be, should, should be part of Jesus' ministry. We think that's ridiculous. We think that's silly. Those are outcasts. Don't have anything to do with them. Jesus says, the reason I go to them is because they know they're sick spiritually. And I'm the great physician, and I can help them if they know they're sick. But the Jewish leaders don't know they're sick with sin. They don't think they're not righteous. They think they're righteous. Jesus can't help them if they think they're righteous, and they're really not. Romans chapter 3 would say, how many are righteous? No, not one. How many are good? None. They think they're good. They think they're righteous. Levi and people like Levi understand, I need a physician. I need help. I need forgiveness. So when this paralytic comes along, here's my point. Jesus is saying, I'm not just about healing here. I'm about salvation from sin your sins are forgiven yes take up your mat and walk which is easier for me to do to heal or to pronounce forgiveness of sins they're both the same for me but why have i come to preach the good news of the kingdom so let me get to the bottom line here what i want to say about this is as jesus beautiful feet went to different kinds of people he didn't just help their hurts did he he has to get the good message of the kingdom to them so that they can be saved from their sin now in the lord's church i've always seen the tension for my many years in the church i've always seen a tension between well how much benevolence do we do and how much evangelism do we do and it would go back and forth. Should we do one or the other? Should we do both? How much should we do of each one? And my point is this. Are we Red Cross? Or are we Christ Cross? Is there anything wrong with the Red Cross? Of course not. But what business is the Lord's church in? Okay. So when you go. As you go, as your beautiful feet go, you too, and as churches, we too have to find the balance between helping people in their trials and tribulations and making sure they get the good news. Sometimes in the church today, it's, it's like we've swung to the other extreme. Let's just go help people over their trials out there, and there's no message connected to it. There's no message of salvation. Jesus was caught in that too and said, I must go to other villages because I must preach the good news of the kingdom because that is why I have come. When he sent out his apostles in Luke chapter 9, he told them to do two things. He said, I'm giving you power to heal and make sure you herald the good news. And that's our charge too, is it not? to do both of those because often they're connected it's not that they're disconnected it's not that jesus stopped healing and started only preaching it's not that he only healed and never preached it is the combination of those two i charge you i charge us when our beautiful feet go out there to share the good news that we make sure that we've got the message along with the healing don't go to one extreme or the other. Be where Jesus was as a church. Be where Jesus was as an individual in regard to those two things. Does that make sense? Is it coming through? See where I'm going with that? Okay. All right.
Here's the second guy I want to talk about. A rich young ruler, Luke chapter 18. I picked this one because, well, I'm not going to tell you yet. Luke chapter 18, a certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus turned around and said, Be careful whom you call good. Do you hear the word good a lot? Well, he's a good man. Well, she's a good woman. Well, they do good things. Good, 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 good. It's a word that's used in our society a great deal. And what does that really mean? What are we saying when we say that? I'd like to investigate that for a minute. Because Jesus runs into a lot of what we would call good people in his ministry. He doesn't just deal with all the bad people. He deals with the so-called good people too. Nicodemus a good guy in John chapter 3? Yeah. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't just hang out with the people that have lost their lives completely in messy lives. He doesn't do that. He does plenty of that. Luke makes that very clear. That's his emphasis in Luke. But he doesn't just go to the outcast. He goes to the, what I'm going to call for a minute, good people too. I, uh, I preached a sermon recently, which was part of a series here at, at uh, Sunset. And here was the title of it. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what the context was. We were coming out of a series called Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe. That's kind of an interesting title, isn't it? What we meant to do was zero in on some things that a lot of Christians believe that aren't biblical. And uh, I'm talking about the Christian community now. I'm not just talking about churches of Christ. I'm talking about the Christian community. And one of those things, and I, ha I got picked for this one, which wasn't the easiest one. But here, here was this one. Dead people go to a better place. Now, where I'm coming off with that is, if you go on, if you go in, uh, on the, on the uh, TV and the media, a lot of times there will be a, a, a lot of, well, somebody dies and they were, even the term good will be used. He was a good person. Why, why, would we, why is the media saying that? Normally speaking, why is the media saying that? Talk to me. Why is the media saying that normally? Andy? Okay, all right. Normally it's they, they Phil? Good people give money. There you go. Help good things. There you go. Okay. Okay, good, good, exactly. Those are kind of the good people of our society, good people. That's right. That's right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Look at this statement. Here, look at this statement for just a minute. This is the mayor of New York. All right? Based on the fact that he had given a lot of money to help some very good social issues, this is what he said about himself. I am telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. Does he think he's a good guy? Yes, he does. How does he think he's getting into heaven? On the basis of his good works. He's a good citizen. He doesn't do a lot of bad things. He's a good person. And Jesus is saying, listen, wait a minute, rich young ruler. You need to understand the biblical definition of good. There's only one who is good, and that's God. Everybody else is not good, meaning they're sinners. 
And they need salvation. So tell me something. Is it just all the people that give themselves over to bad lifestyles that need salvation from sin? Or is it also good people? Yes, it's good people too. And the reason I'm saying this is there is a lot of emphasis today. And, and Luke, Luke makes this case. We need to look for people who, whose lives are messed up because oftentimes their receptivity, their, their willingness to hear the gospel is greater than those who, who are living this pretty good lifestyle feeling self-sufficient. That's true. But that doesn't mean that the good people don't need the message too. Don't neglect the good people is what I'm saying. Jesus didn't neglect to take his good feet to the good people too. His beautiful feet to the good people too. Were they always receptive? No. They weren't. So, my point is this. Don't forget the so-called good people. Don't forget the rich young rulers. By the way, I'm one of those good people. I grew up in a good home. Okay? I, I didn't do a lot of bad stuff as a teenager. I, I wasn't a thief. Okay? I, I was obedient to my parents. When I got into adulthood, uh, I, I was a good citizen. I paid my taxes. Do I need the good message to be saved, though? Of course I do. Of course I do. And by the way, I was receptive to that message. So as you go out with your beautiful feet, take your beautiful feet to the good people too. Not just to the outcasts and the people who are living in the slime of society. They may be receptive too, but don't forget us good people out there. Don't forget us. Don't walk by a house thinking, oh, they're rich. Oh, they have it all together. Oh, they're good citizens, and they probably aren't receptive to the gospel. Don't assume that. Because a lot of times, we good people, we start going down paths of life. And if they're not going down the path of life as the Bible describes it, it's a dead-end street. It doesn't go anywhere. It leaves us empty too. Just like those people who are living in the gutter, and they reach out and think, God have mercy on me, a sinner. We good people can reach the end of our roads and say, God have mercy on me, a sinner. This good life is not leading anywhere. Leaves me empty. So, you take your good feet to the good people too. Not just to the outcasts. And, and uh, yeah, I could go on with that, but I'm not going to. Better get on with it. All right, so what's the next category? Ah, let's talk about them older people. Them old people. You know the story in Luke chapter 2. There are two old people in the temple, aren't they? Simeon and Anna. And here comes baby Jesus. Joseph and Mary got baby Jesus. And they're looking down at that little darling. And, and there, are, there are a lot of people in the temple. And here comes Simeon. He grabs that baby. Here comes Anna. She grabs that baby. And they're like, well, who, who are these? But who are these people? They're godly people who have been waiting for the Christ to come. They've been waiting a long time. The Messiah to come. They've been waiting for the beautiful feet of the Messiah to come. The Christ. Now when they took that baby in their hands, they probably looked down at that baby, and they didn't just see a baby. They saw the salvation of Israel. In Luke, it's, it's called redemption. It's called consolation. But it's the same thing. They're looking for the salvation of their nation and the salvation of themselves. Just a couple of old people in the temple. Who bothers with them? I mean, Anna's a widow and she's a woman, and there was a there was a there was sort of a, a, a bad place in people's mind about women in that society, but also a widow. Why why couldn't she get married again? Why, or where are her children? Something must be wrong with her. She's just an old woman who hangs out in the temple all the time. What, why bother with her? And here's this old man, Simeon. Who's he? Who's he? 
They have been waiting for the good news messenger. And now he's here. And so as they're holding that baby, you think they don't go down there and count the toes? Count the fingers like mom and dad did? These, as they're bouncing that baby, those little feet of the baby are going against their arm a little bit. Do you think they're thinking, ooh, these are beautiful feet? Did the beautiful feet of Jesus come for older people too? What kind of culture do we live in? What's the emphasis? Is it, is it about a bunch of old people? Or is it about youth? A lot of emphasis on youth. Now, we baby boomers, we're getting older, and so they still want our dollars, so they still advertise to us. Okay? But, but there's a lot of emphasis on youth. Youth. Even in the Lord's church sometimes. The emphasis on, we've got to turn all of our attention to the youth. When we're reaching out to people, it's the youth that are receptive. When they get older, they're not receptive anymore. That's not necessarily true, is it? It's sort of like, find the good people that are receptive. They're out there. Don't write off all the good people. Well, hey, don't write off all the old people either. Because there's some good ones out there. I don't know if you run into some of those older people. You may think some of those people are kind of young compared to you. But what about the older people? What about the older people that are not saved yet? What about the older people that are not saved yet? When I moved to Dallas in 1972 to, be, to work with youth, okay, there was a preacher there that talked to me about his ministry when he was a preacher in Oklahoma. He talked about how many older people he had led to the Lord in that, in that particular town. That kind of shocked me. Because I kind of had the idea, well, once they, you know, once they get to 25, they've got everything settled and they're kind of turning off any new message. They're not receptive to the gospel. He straightened me out on that. And our society is living to be older. And they have their mental faculties about them. And they're still sometimes open to new messages. My wife works with hospice here in town, one of the hospice companies. She only works part-time now. But she used to tell me when she'd work full-time with them, she would come home from visits that she would make. And she would talk about people who are on hospice that know they're close to dying. And, and a lot of times they are going through their life choices. A lot of times they weren't good life choices. And they're looking for a way out. They don't know what it is. They're sad. Sometimes they're mad. Sometimes they're mean. It's all kinds of different reactions. But here's my point. There are some Simeons and Annas. There are some older people in your places that are still receptive. I mean, I'm looking at some older folks here. You're still learning. You're still receptive to God's message when you hear it. Are there others out there that aren't even Christians yet that are open to that message too? It's not just the young. Find those older people that are also receptive and that Jesus was willing to go to. Will your feet be the ones to bring them the good news of salvation also? Find them. By the way, I'm not very good at that. I, 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 some of, sometimes we have to learn where they are. Sometimes they're in nursing homes. Just because they're in nursing homes doesn't mean they've all lost their faculties about themselves, have they? And they're captive audiences. And they're looking for people to visit with them. They're looking for people to come in their rooms and share with them. Is it not a good time to share a message of the good news of salvation? Don't overlook the old people. Don't overlook the good people. Number four. How about the children? How about the children? I'm going back to a youth now. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, and Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, Jesus deals with, with some children that are come to him. But, but before we go there, uh, you've seen these celebrities, 
on TV or, or maybe you've seen him in the airport or somewhere like that. And uh, a celebrity's not normally just by themselves, are they? They've got an entourage. They've got, they've got bodyguards and they've got groupies and I don't know who all's following them around. They're not by themselves. Here's Jesus with his 12, with the 70. I mean, Jesus is a celebrity. And so when these little children come, what are the apostles doing? Shoot, shoot. It's sort of like when, when uh, a celebrity and the entourage that surrounds him doesn't want anybody to get his autograph. They shoo him away. And it's like, oh, who are these bothersome children coming to see Jesus? They don't have any part in this ministry. He doesn't care about children, surely. He cares about adults like us. It's not true, is it? It's not true at all. If you were to see LeBron James in, the, in public, you think he'd have anybody around him? Know who LeBron James is, don't you? Basketball player. Yeah, those big shots, they're going to have people around them. Jesus, when the apostles try to shoo them away, says, no, no, let them come to me. Here's the passage. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He's not just saying adults have to become like children. He is also saying, based on this second passage, I am interested in these children where they are right now. So look what he says in Mark chapter 10, or what the scripture says about him. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Did he touch them? Did he touch them? Yes. If you look at Luke very carefully, Jesus is always touching people. Is there something about touch? Is touch pretty special? Absolutely. It conveys you have identity. You are important. I'm stopping to think about you. Uh, it, 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 it elevates people in the person who's touching them sight. Are these children important? Apostles stop shooing them away. And he touches them. And he puts them in his lap. And he puts them in his arms. Touching is very important. But then it says he blessed them. He blessed them. Uh, one of the other parallel texts says he prayed for them. Wonder what he prays for them. What's his mission? To bring salvation to the people. What's he thinking about these children? They're going to grow up in all kinds of homes. I might not see them again while I'm on this earth. What do I wish for them? What do I wish for these children? That they grow up someday and hear the message. That they will remember that this man whom they hear the message about when they get to be an adult, was the one who took me into his arms. They experienced the love of Jesus. And hopefully that sticks with them. And when they get to be an adult, they'll be receptive to the message. Were the children important to him? Indeed. Because he's thinking about the future. He's thinking about little ones. Some of whom can't hear some can let me give you a couple of examples of how important i think this is i'm in new zealand as a missionary in the 1980s and we have a student in the bible college there i was teaching in a similar bible college there and uh this this young man came to me and said uh, none of his family were members of the lord's church i said how did you become interested in the lord's church he said well he said, early on in my neighborhood, I got this flyer, this brochure about a vacation Bible school. He went to two or three vacation Bible schools just for fun. It was something to do during the summer. And now because when I got older and I started thinking about what do I want to do with my life and I'm not finding purpose in my life, he remembered that church who cared enough about him to put that VBS on. Now, you're looking at one who doesn't like VBSs very much, okay? But I wonder how many people, how many children 
have grown up going through our VBSs who are members of our community. I'm not talking about our own children right now. I'm talking about from the community who at some point when they got older said, hey, I'm checking out that church. I'm checking out why those people did that for me. Now I'm going to come back to the church setting for just a moment. Even in the church setting, our children are so important, so important. We've kind of adopted a particular family around here because they actually adopted us. They have three children. Uh, we've been hanging out with them, I guess, for, I don't know, four years or so. And we've watched their kids grow up, and we're around their kids. And, and they expose them to all kinds of older people. Mm. And uh, so they have lots of grandfathers and grandmothers in this congregation. And yes, that's not to say they don't hang out with their own age too. But these parents have said, we know how important to our children it is to be exposed to and around godly people. I think it's going to make a difference in the choices they make ongoing through life. Yeah, their parents are the most important people in their life. But I think those kids are going to grow up and remember all these people in the body of Christ that love them. They come up and hug everybody on every Sunday morning, you know. And, and uh, I mean, so I'm saying to you, within the body, don't neglect the children. But also, we're talking about beautiful feet to the children out there. You look like you're an older culture. I know in the hearing church, we're an older culture in most places. Where are the children? What will, be, where, what will we be like in 50 years? What will you be like? In 50 years. If we just minister to the old people. If we neglect the children. We got to find ways to be people of beautiful feet. Toward the children of our communities. And hopefully they'll make those choices. Were you guys around in the bus ministry days of the 70s? Were you around then? Man we reached out to thousands and thousands of children. Some of those became Christians. I'm not suggesting we go back to the bus ministry. I don't even know. But you've got to find beautiful ways to get to those people. Here's the last one. Oh, let me say this in, in passing. This is what I call the John the Baptist principle, this children thing. Because these children are like John. The, our ministry to these children is like John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not get to see Jesus fulfill his ministry, did he? Altogether. I mean... He, just before he dies, he's sending a messenger to Jesus to say, are you the one? He's about to have his head chopped off. He doesn't even know if his ministry has been fulfilled. He, he's told by Jesus, yes, I am the one. And so maybe he went to his death thinking, yes, okay, my ministry is fulfilled. But I didn't get to see it all. A lot of us are going to go to our deaths before these children that we're raising up become the church of the future. But we've got to have enough love for the next generation, not just our church, not just what we like, not just what's good for us in this generation while we're alive, but also that next generation. What are we going to leave behind? I call it the John the Baptist principle. Okay, finishing up here. Let's talk about the centurion, last one, in Luke chapter 7. Uh, is he a Jew? No, he's a Gentile. The Jews, like Jew, the Jews like Jesus going to Gentiles. They like that. They're not crazy about that at all. But they do like this guy because he's given money to build their synagogue. So, so they like him. But the centurion is also concerned about his slave. So here's a Gentile, and he's concerned about his slave and Jesus has, has basically said, I have come to Jews only in my ministry. So does Jesus stop right there? Does he say, I'm not getting outside the boundaries that I've established for myself? No. He ministers to the centurion. And he heals the servants. And that was a Gentile and a slave. Now, to me, it all kind of comes together at this point because... I see Jesus reaching out to all kinds of people, all classes. That's really it, isn't it? 
He doesn't have this narrow focus of people that he's ministering to that he's just zeroed in on and, and he's not going to be the beautiful feet to anybody else. He's gone to a Gentile. He's gone to a slave. He's gone to children. He's gone to older people. He's gone to younger. He's gone to the good people. He's gone to the slime. He's gone to all of them. I suppose that's where I want to end up because it's reflected in Jesus' statements. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for a few. Did I read that correctly? For just a few? For many. How many are many? All. All. Matthew chapter 26, 28, when he's taking that Lord's Supper, he says, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for a few? No, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. 1 John chapter 2, skip to the second verse where it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Oh, speaking of Christians, He's our atoning sacrifice, but not for ours only, also for the sins of the whole world. And that's children. Not that they're lost while they're a child. I'm not saying that. That's for everybody. We're talking about the Great Commission here, aren't we? We cannot say, you know what? I'm this church, and I'm just going to focus on this group of people through this lens. I don't think we have that choice if we're going to be like Jesus. We are the beautiful feet of Jesus, carrying on his work, his message, his healing, and his heralding to all kinds of people. Whether we're comfortable with that or we're willing to get out of our comfort zone. I'm young, he's old. We're going to cross those barriers. I'm deaf. He's hearing. Are we going to cross that barrier? I'm old. He's young. Are we going to cross that barrier? I've come out of a very bad lifestyle, and I'm a Christian now, and this person's grown up in a wonderful culture, but, but they're still lost. Am I going to cross that barrier? Am I the beautiful feet of Jesus? How beautiful are the feet of Jesus? who brought us good news. And then here are our beautiful feet to go into all the world, to all kinds of people. And so I guess I want to leave you with this note. I don't want this just to be kind of a generic, we got to go into all the world kind of thing. I want you to think about the areas where you, where you personally, where you as a church, where you as a culture, have we gotten, have we excluded any groups that Jesus wouldn't have excluded? Have we narrowed our focus so much on particular groups that we have excluded other groups? Or are we need to zero in on certain groups that we have neglected in the past so that all within our hearing voice and all within the ability of our feet to trod hear the good news of salvation? Thank you.